This is part two of a series that we began last time addressing some mischaracterizations of dispensationalism. Today what we're going to talk about is what is the core tenet of dispensationalism? What is it that really drives dispensationalism? You can remove many other things, but what is the core element of dispensationalism? My special guest, Doug Bookman, and I have a discussion about that very thing. Coming up. This is the Bible Sojourner, where we discuss issues related to the Bible, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, professor of Old Testament and Biblical Languages at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Shalom and welcome. Thanks for joining. Welcome back to another episode of The Bible Sojourner. This is a part two episode. We completed an episode last time where we started to do a broad review of the Al Mohler and Daniel Hummel interview on the Thinking in Public podcast. And basically, what they were intending to do on that podcast was review Daniel Hummel's book and what it turned out to be was a little less of a review of the book as much as it was a discussion of the negatives of dispensationalism. And so I invited my good friend Doug Bookman onto the podcast to ch- kind of just chat with me a little bit about some of the critiques that are raised in that interview, as well as kind of the critiques that exist at large against dispensationalism. So last episode, we covered that. And so if you haven't heard that, I definitely encourage you to check that out. But today, what I want to do is I want to, again, with my good friend, Doug Bookman here, I want to ask exactly what is dispensationalism? What sets it apart? Because that is really, I mean, if we're thinking about the issue, this is the issue where everyone, if if they're branching off in the wrong direction, this is where it starts. So what is dispensationalism? And then how does that define the the terms for biblical interpretation, for example? So, with that kind of as the table being set, if you will, uh, book. What do you what do you want to say on that? Well, uh, I'm going to pick up on exactly what you just said, and that is that this is the issue. Now, again, I don't know that on that podcast they set out at any time to discuss that, but I think it's fair to say that. Anybody who is familiar with the debate, the contention between dispensationalism and non-dispensationalism would, would kind of expect that that was. And regardless of their intent, they, by reason, I think, of a number of mischaracterizations and so on, they, they left everybody with a, a, a very, very flawed, actually mistaken and, and I think destructive uh, impression of what dispensationalism is. So without going back over that, uh, what we set out to do as we talked about this, uh, Pete and I, is to say, all right, let's see if we can refocus the discussion. Uh, and, and that's why we said the, the, the podcast that Dr. Moeller did is sort of just the background to it, but we're not responding to that. We're saying that if, if you're going to engage, and you should, you, you, any thinking deliberate believer, any careless indeliberate believer, if you want to know the truth, ought to be asking himself the question, ought to consider the question, What's the proper way to read the Bible? And again, the charge was made, and I think it's entirely wrong, that dispensationalism is some big, hideous, complicated, self-contradictory, labyrinthic, tortuous system that, that uh, uh, you know, it was compared to, to medieval, you know, philosophical systems and so on. And so here I get to the point, Peter. Because I, 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 I think it's fair to say, and I will ac- absolutely insist, that A, the real question in terms of just taxonomizing the importance of questions, the real question is, is dispensationalism a legitimate way to read the Bible? And if you're going to ask that question, then the first thing you have to ask is, the next question you have to ask is, well, what is dispensationalism in terms of its hermeneutics, the way it reads the Bible. And I am going to insist that dispensationalism at its core, at its happy, healthy, productive core, is nothing more than a commitment to play by the rules of human language when you're reading the Bible. Now, that doesn't seem like any sort 
of conceptual stretch, you know, oh, play by the rules. It seems to me that, and there are rules. Folks, I mean, God invented human language. He created human language in order that he might communicate with sentient beings. And I I think without, if you don't play by the rules, and this is true in any area of life, but if you don't play by the rules of, la- of, of language, the common, ordinary rules of language, then it's impossible for, for God to communicate to men, for God to communicate to angels, for angels to communicate to men, and so on, all of which goes on. And, and there's nothing more important in you know, the moral universe than the reality that God is making himself graciously known to mankind. How does he do that? He does it with words, with language. And so the point is that that, that there are simple rules to human language. You don't have to necessarily spell them out. You, you, that's the way you talk. It's the way you, you visit with one another. It's interesting to me. Well, I better come to that later. So dispensationalism is simply a commitment. And, and it'll be said they, they believe in grammatical, historical exegesis. All right, without getting into the vagaries and the complexity. It's not that complex, but the, but the details of that. All it means is you're going to play by the rules. And the first rule of human language, the without which not in terms of being able to communicate, is that words mean something. Words have a meaning. And you, 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 you can't just arbitrarily decide. You know, Abraham, and I, this is one of the stops. You mentioned that we go to Israel, and, and, and when there's not any, you know, a, 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 crippling tension in the country. Uh, one of the places that I love to go, and my, our dear friend Joel Kramer taught me to do this, is to actually Bethel. What in the Bible is Bethel? Now, the name actually kind of migrates to the city, but the Bethel is a spot where, first of all, Abram and then Jacob pitched their tent, and it says that uh, they had I on the east and Bethel on the west, and they're only about a mile apart, and there's only one spot that is archaeologically dug and it is a huge Byzantine church and then a huge Crusader church. There's no doubt that's the spot. So I love to go to that spot and go to Genesis uh, chapter 13 and, and where God says to Abram, this is after he divides the land with Lot, and God says to, to Abram, look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west, all the land that I give you, I give to all that land that you see, I give to you and your generations. And then he says, go and walk the land. And wherever your foot trods, the land is yours. And we're told today, well, land really means security. And where is your security? So your security is in Jesus. So really, the land is a reference to the Messiah. No, land does not mean Messiah. And if you're witnessing to us of somebody and you say, you need to really realize that Jesus is the long-promised land, and you need to accept uh, Jesus as, as, as the land in your life. No, that, that would be silly, because you're, you, you, Messiah and land are not interchangeable terms. And, and the thing is that this idea that you can just break the rules and make the words mean something, they, it wouldn't work anywhere else. You know, take a word, okay, because I was just think of some silly illustrations. Forgive me, but take the word window. All right, now, now window means something. It, has, you, it, it means an opening in a wall. You might use it to uh, you talk about a window of opportunity, something like this. It might have some word pictures. But the word picture only works if you acknowledge the simple, non-negotiable meaning of window. So if you say, I'm tired, I'm going to go up the window and go to bed. You know, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, when I say window, I mean stairs. That's how I use the word. No, you, you can't do that. You know, right. uh, you, you, you're sitting at a restaurant and, and, and you want to order a malted milk and, and the waitress says, well, we have, we have chocolate, we have strawberry, we have vanilla, we have butterscotch. And you say, well, I'd like a potato malt. Potato malt, that's disgusting. Well, when I say potato, I mean chocolate. Well, you, can, that, you couldn't do that in any area of life is my point. Right. And so, and so all throughout the Old Testament, God makes promises to Israel. He spells it out that he means Israel. He means the Judah and you know the two, two the northern and southern tribes. And we're told today, well, what he really meant was church. Hmm. 
you know, I, I found myself in a bit of a debate one time, and he was a good friend. I love this guy. He was a former student. I haven't heard from him for 30 years. But, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, his, our lives went different directions. But he had just graduated from the college where I was teaching, and, and he had embraced uh, non-dispensation. He was, uh, I'm a millennialist. And uh, I remember, we, and, and, he, and, and he said, it wasn't a formal thing, but a bunch of students had kind of set this up. And, and so I remember he said, uh, now, Bookman, you got to understand that in the Old Testament, when God said, Israel, he really meant the church, but it took the maturity of the New Testament to teach them that what he really meant was the church. And so it wasn't their fault. It was that the reason they misunderstood him was because they didn't have the maturity of the New Testament. I said, no, Jason, the reason when he said Israel, that they thought he meant Israel is because he said Israel. Revelationary, yeah, exactly, and 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 there's there there, there and, and and so at any rate, that's what it is to be a dispensation to read the Bible and allow the Bible to to the words to mean what they say. Now, I would just want to jump in on that yep, because yep. I think that you know going back to one of the critiques that we addressed last time in the previous episode was this charge that dispensationalism is so complicated and it's in, it's too complex exactly. to be a valid system but it sounds to me what you're saying and I'm being facetious cuz obviously I agree with you is that it's actually a very simple idea that you just read the bible and what it says that is what it means exactly at every point and and can that can can that simple commitment that we're going to read the Bible to actually say what it means and, and God knows how to say what he means and he means what he says, as we say, that can, that'll flesh itself out in all sorts of thoughts and systems and putting things together and comparing passages. That's fine, but that's not dispensationalism. I mean, Moeller says that, that dispensation is so complicated because you get all these systems and these and seven different things, and charts this, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Well, I think he could make the case that the alphabet is really complicated because <laughs> you can take that alphabet, you can make all these words and all these sentences and all these paragraphs and all these different things. It's really, no, the alphabet is simple enough to teach at the kindergartners for heaven's mm-hmm. sakes, but to be sure it can be fleshed out. And so, and the other dynamic that's at stake with regard to to uh, I think specifically the Bible, but but it would apply in any other area of life. And the, and the point I'm trying to make is that you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't go into business with somebody who felt like he could do that. He could use words any way he wanted oh, and yeah. so on. Any area of life, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to uh, you know choose as your wife somebody who could use language to mean anything. It's unlivable. Life is unlivable. But yet we think it's okay to do this with the scripture. And the other dynamic or the not dynamic but the other commitment uh but let's go this way another rule by which uh, 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 you know playing by the rules with regard to language is is this these two pillars that we call authorial intent and and fixed meaning which is simply to say that it is the author who insinuates the meaning into what he writes. Now we can get into big A, little A. I don't think that's very healthy because I think there was no separate process. But nonetheless, the words that hit the page, the words that the Spirit of God bore the prophet or apostle along in order to enable him and direct him, although he's using his mind and he's fully engaged and God knows how to put all this together, the, the, the words on the page are exactly what he meant and what he meant his readers or listeners to hear. And, 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 and so the author insinuates the meaning, and once he puts it on paper, it's, it, that's what it means. It's fixed meaning. And, and yet today you have this, this, this uh, I don't know, this passion that, that uh, uh, you know, the word, the, 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 that, that, that what, you have this idea that what the scriptures say somehow take on new and different and contrary meaning as time goes by. And I know this is a huge debate. It's a hermeneutical debate. But we're asking the question, what is dispensationalism? Right. And it simply says that you play by the rules. And I always think, you know, we're told today, well, yeah, but, but you know, what God said in the Old Testament uh, you know, the New Testament is the fuller. Now we're into a little something different, but, but dispensationalism cannot go here. They can't g- g- embrace this idea. They can't tolerate the idea. I mean, can interpret personally, but as far as their, 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 the, the, the intellectual construct and the way they read the Bible, they can't abide the possibility 
that that God would say something in the Old Testament, and then somebody come along in the New Testament and say, no, it doesn't mean that. It means something different. Mike Black always says God doesn't need a second chance, you know, a second pass. <laughs> and 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 but that idea is is so rampant. And like I say, uh, it wouldn't work anywhere else. Right. And 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 the other thing is, Pete. And this is maybe I I don't know. I don't think this is entirely unfair, but. But if that's the case, if God said something in the Old Testament, made promises to Israel, oops, he made promises to Israel in the Old Testament, and then later, better, more true revelation came along that said, no, no, it's, I didn't mean Israel, I meant the church. Well, how do we know this is the last stage of revelation? Sure. Might there be another stage of revelation? So sometime along the way, God's going to send another, I don't know, some, some spokesman, and, and, and God's going to say, now, wait a minute, we've moved on. And when I said, whosoever believes shall not perish, you thought I meant believe in the sense of like trust and trust yourself. You know, he who believes is not, you thought I meant believe in the sense of trust. Well, actually what I meant was you have to be able to bench press 400 pounds. And you say, and, 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 and if you can't, you're, you're in trouble because you can't bench press 400, 400 pounds. I'm sorry. You say, well, wait a minute. Believe? Bench press 400 pounds? Those are not even distantly related. You can't get from Israel and the church? There's, there's, there's just every bit as much conceptual difference between Israel as a nation and so on as, and the church as there is. So it's, it's dispensationalism commits itself to playing by the rules of human language. Now, I want to jump in yeah. on this because I think this is a really helpful thing to talk about. But one of the things that Hummel points out, and and actually I really appreciated this part of his book, like we mentioned last episode, I think there were, there were a bunch of parts that we both appreciated in the historical narrative that he mm-hmm. portrays, even though we would disagree on certain parts. But one of the things that he makes a big deal of going going on is that some of the early dispensationalists, and I think we should be forward with this, some of the early dispensationalists were inconsistent by this very principle. And I think, I mean, I'm not ashamed of that. I know you're not ashamed of that. I mean, but like we talked about last time, this is part of that continuation of a self-correcting system where we refine things and say, hey, because you you were crazy on typology, you were went way too far because there's no chance that that is what the exactly. original author was intending, and so there's this always refining process, and so that's why dispensationalists today look different than I mean you can't say that dispensationalists believe what Darby believed because we are so different now because we've been trying to apply that normal usage of language and the only. The only criterion, the only measuring stick, the only canon we have to decide on this or that particular of this or that dispensationalist construct is the Bible. We're just going to go to the Bible and, and listen, Pete, there are the dispensationalism I hold today is not the dispensationalism I, you know, I taught, I started teaching 50 years ago and I, I taught a course in dispensationalism. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to go and try and find those people and give their money back. But, <laughs> but the fact is that there are elements of that, that I would say at best are distractions and, and, you know, conjectures. And at worst, sometimes really kind of cripple the system, I, right. I it, the system, they, 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 they have no legitimate role to play in the attempt to read the Bible for what it says. Right. So, yeah, I, and so, so that would be, and I, I would, I would invite our listeners to now, you know, go ahead and you know, throw brick bats at me or us or whatever. That's fine, but just ask yourself the question: Is there anything more important than how I read the Bible? Hmm. And dispensationalism is all about nothing more than you're going to play by the rules of normal human language. Now, again, there are those who find that novel and crippling. So let me, let me take it another step, and here's where— Well, before you do that, yeah, actually, I want to jump in because some people who are listening aren't dispensationalists, and they say, well, wait, wait a second. I thought all dispensationalists had to hold to seven dispensations, or I thought all dispensationalists had to hold to a pre-trib rapture, or I thought all dispensationalists had to hold to X, Y, Z. And I think uh, you can correct me if you don't no. agree with this, but— but I think what what you're saying and what I would what I would say is that 
there's a method that is dispensationalism of approaching Scripture, and when somebody approaches Scripture this way, you arrive at certain beliefs. But the system itself is hermeneutical in nature, where we're not Everything. imposing a system on Scripture, we're deriving theology, and it just so happens if you read Scripture a certain way, you do arrive at these core beliefs. The essentials of this, yeah. And you brought up the core word, and that is hermeneutics. Now, I think most of your listeners tend to be astute, and they don't have to be schooled as to what hermeneutics is, but hermeneutics is simply a, 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 the way, you know, it's a, a, the way you read literature, and, and, and normal hermeneutics, whatever you want to call it, it's going to, if somebody came to me and said that I am a dispensationalist, but I don't believe God has a future for Israel, I'd have to sit down and say, all right, take me to the scriptures and show me where I'm wrong. Right, because and I and a thousand other voices, but I'm the you know not important. But 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 the point is that our question is not is not here's the checklist. Check these things off, and if you check all of them, you get to be a dis. Our our checklist is: Are you simply trying to read the Bible for what it says? Amen. And that and it really is. It's that simple. And out of that arises the 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 converse, if you don't mind, question or obverse, and that is. What is it to be a non-dispensationalist? Mm-hmm. And this is where, this is not going to go over well. <laughs> this is where you lose all of our followers. <laughs> That's right. We may. But I would say that, honestly, and I don't, I don't say this with any sort of a mean spirit, I, because I, I, I'm, I, I refuse to be at all cavalier about this question, how ought you to read your Bible? But I think it's fair to say that to be a non-dispensationalist is to decide that in certain cases, you're not going to play by the rules, the normal rules of human language. And uh, I, I will suggest, and this is my thumbnail and self-serving summary of, of early Christian history or non, uh, post-apostolic history, I, I think it's fair to say that in, in the immediately post-apostolic age, there were, there were two communities who couldn't handle the Old Testament scriptures. And the one, quite frankly, and, and please understand, I, I've given my, I've worked in Jewish evangelism, I love the Jewish people, I know all parts, but I think it's absolutely fair to say, and I can vindicate this a hundred times, that, uh, that the one group that couldn't, understand, couldn't handle the Old Testament was the, the Jewish world, because if they allowed the Old Testament to say what it was clearly trying to say, then guess what? That Nazarene is your Messiah. This is, this is Acts chapter 6. This is Stephen, you know, just a nobody deacon who is, is, is going face to face with the greatest minds, including, you know, the, the young Saul. And uh, uh, he argues him in such a corner that all he can do is go out and stone him. And so, and this is Paul's case everywhere he goes, it takes the scriptures and take some of the Old Testament, to, to their scriptures, take them to the Hebrew, that's all he had. Well, that in the book of Matthew, but that's another <laughs> question. But, but my point is that, that if, 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 this, if they simply read their own scriptures, they're going to be forced. Read the, this is an aside, but read the delightful testimony of Mike Ray Delnick, good friend, uh, great, great apologist. But, but in his book, The Prophetic Hope, he talks about how as a, as a Jew, he was totally didn't have anything to do with Christians and so on. I think I think it was his sister, but it might have been another relative who got saved and said, "Michael, you know enough about what Jesus is in the Christian world. Read your Bible and tell me if you find Jesus." <laughs> That's how he became a believer. Today he's wow. a very important. So, and this this can be again and again be replicated that testimony. All right, that's not my point though. It's a blessed point, but. But what I'm saying is that there was the Jewish world who couldn't handle the Old Testament, their scriptures, I should say, the Hebrew scriptures, because if they allowed it to say what it was trying to say, what it was clearly not what it was trying to say, what it was saying, then they couldn't avoid the conclusion that the Nazarene is the promised Messiah. And so they invented a hermeneutic. Now, it was ready to hand. The whole Greek world had been practicing this, but they embraced largely through the efforts of Philo. That's the where we usually go. And, and basically, it was a spiritualizing, allegorizing, non-literal hermeneutic that was not designed to help them understand what was written, but to avoid what was written. Now, mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a serious 
accusation. I realize that's a, that's a, that's an un, impolite indictment. I would not make, I would want somebody to charge me with that, but I think it's a defensible indictment. And, and I, I go on and on about that for a bit, but on the other hand, the other community was the early Christian community and they too could not handle the Hebrew scriptures because if they let it say what it's trying to say, God had a future for Israel. And their theology told them God was done with Israel. Israel was to be despised. And they had ready to hand Philo to Origen to Augustine and so on, this hermeneutic. So I, I, I don't think it's unfair to say that I, I, I will insist, as we did earlier, that, and you made the point that very simply to be a dispensation is to play by the rules of the human language and read the Bible. Uh, by process almost of elimination, I think it's fair to say to be a non-dispensationalist. And, and, and is, is, to, is to decide that in certain instances, and it's back, we're back to the microscope and the bug, because if my theology can't withstand the Old Testament itself, if I let it, then I have to find a way to make the Old Testament say something other than what it's saying. And that's what, and I, again, I, 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 just to, as, a, as a silly analogy, and I realize analogies can't prove, okay, but I think they can throw an issue maybe into sharp relief. So let me suggest a silly analogy, and that is, say you decided, not you, but the, the, somebody decided that it was really important for him to win the Boston Marathon, not to enter, but to win. He had to win the Boston Marathon. He hadn't trained. He hadn't run. He, couldn't, he knew they couldn't possibly do it. So he came up with a plan, and I, because I was thinking about this, I did a little first-level research on the marathon and so on. It's, it's fascinating, but let's, let's leave that aside. This has happened a number of times, but let's say that, that this person invited. It was so important for me to win the marathon that I'm just going to, I'll be in the starting, a big gaggle, all those people, and then I'll kind of slip away, and I'll just go over behind a tree or find a porta potty, you know, and I'll go in and I'll put on my clothes, and I'll come out and I'll get my car and I'll drive all the way down to the end, and I'll park about a half mile short of the uh, the finish line and I can watch and see how close they're getting. And so I'll get out and, and, you know, work up a sweat and do some calisthenics and sneak back in it. And I'll come running up and I'll win the marathon. And you do that. Okay. I know you can't get away with it, but let's just say, all right, you were able to get away with it. And so there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a, a trophy stand and you're given a big trophy and you go, I mean, and I won the Boston marathon. And you say, now, wait a minute. I don't think you won the, you didn't play by the rules. Oh, oh, but you need to understand that I did a lot of history about early Greco-Roman races and so on. And there was a lot of cheating and people were getting pushed off the race and people would cut across. And so historically that was always done. So I'm a historical marathoner. I, I, I did it the way they used to do it. Yeah, but the rules say you got to play, you got to run it on the course. Well, now, wait a minute. I did some research on the word course, and you know, there's a semantic range, and it can mean that uh, a, a, a route of, the, of your own choice. So I decided that's the meaning I would take, and so I, you know, I, I'm abiding by the rules as I, as I understand them. And then you say, besides that, if I didn't win the marathon, the guy who was certain to win it is an awful scoundrel, and we wouldn't want that to happen. So it was really important that I win the marathon. And so, uh, you know, I did it by sort of inventing my own rules. You no, no, you cheated. No, I don't want to use that word, but I, I admit I played by my own rules. And, and again, it's, it's, it's not an immediate parallel. I don't say that, but I'm just saying that if you decide you're not going to play by the rules, any set of and you know, the other thing, any set of explanations or rationale or, or excuses on it won't work. And the curious thing that in order to make that case, you know, I'm a historical marathoner or whatever, I got to step back in to the world where you play by the rules. So you got to step into my worldview in order to make your case. And you've got to expect that I'm going to listen to your words and expect and understand your words just as you mean them. And, and, and those words are designed to defend the position that you don't have to play by the rules. So, uh, again, the, 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 I, I think it is fair to say that non-dispensationalism is simply a, I, I don't think it's a prior commitment, but in order to get there, 
because, again, there are elements of non-dispensational theology. I don't care what brand. I mean, there are all sorts. And, 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 and one of the problems that you and I both have with the book, number one, what's the subtitle of the book? How, end time? how the Evangelical ba- Battle Over the End Time Shaped a Nation. And, and dispensationalism is not primarily about, it's only secondarily by derivation about the end times. You read the Bible literally and you come away with an end time drama that's pretty well described and there are specific figures and places and so on, so you factor those in. But it's not about eschatology, it's about how do you read your Bible. And so my point is, I think it's it's perfectly fair to say that dispensationalism, by definition, is a simple commitment to playing by the rules. And any other system is going to have to, when necessary, decide not to play by the rules of human language. And uh, I, I think that's, frankly, I think is it, it is at once intellectually destructive. You can't have meaningful communication if everybody didn't agree that we're going to play by those rules. And I think it's morally morally questionable. I, I, I don't think there is nobility in abandoning the normal rules of language in order to make a case. Now, let me jump in there because I know this is going to be one of the things, and I'm tracking with you, and I think that you're making some excellent points. Uh, although I'm thinking that one of the questions that people will probably have on their mind is, are you, are you broad brushing all d- non-dispensationalists? Maybe so. Maybe so. I, I, and, and if so, I apologize. I'm not really interested in making a case against them. I just don't know of any who, to the degree, listen, the, I think the defining, seminal, animating commitment of every non-dispensational system of thought that I know is supersessionism replacement theology. God rejected Israel in favor of the church. I, we don't have to go deeply into that, but I, I think you certainly can't get there without, without breaking the rules of, of normal human language. So maybe there are some, some, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, even, even some people have found, have insisted they found a middle way and so on, but it seems to me that the question, it, 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 in, not in terms of what's either entirely ontologically native to or is most important, but perhaps the litmus test is, do you believe God has a future for national Israel? Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I, as, as you're talking, I'm, I'm just thinking that I think it makes a lot of sense with, say, versions of covenant theology and where it's just overt theological interpretation yes. and, you know, structure of covenant of grace, covenant of works, uh, covenant of redemption being superimposed on scripture. And of course they're arguing, well, we're getting it from somewhere, but that's a debate obviously, yeah. but then it becomes imposed on other texts. But so, so that would be an example of, I think exactly what you're talking about. And as I'm thinking, you know, what about some other, some of these other camps, uh, some, and I would say some people who are, who wouldn't claim to be dispensational, they they follow, or, or at least by their voice, give give lip service to the fact that we do need to follow those rules of interpretation. Mm-hmm. But then one of the things that I've noticed, and again, I think this would vary from circumstance to circumstance, but everyone is a product of a bias and a system. Uh, a lot of times coming out of, out of, in fact, you know, our our mutual acquaintance, Mike Heiser, uh, you know, as he passed away this earlier this year, but, but one of the things that he was really well known for was rejecting basically all eschatological discussion basically. Yes, right. And, but what was interesting and I I've benefited from Heiser and I appreciate some of the things that he does and I disagree with him on, you know, many things, but, but one of the things that I've, I noticed even in his interpretation was his anti-system or his anti, you know, eschatological nuance actually influenced how he would interpret other passages too. So in in one sense, the, the only thing I'm trying to add to your statement, I'm probably doing it poorly, is that uh, there are a lot of people who 
end up being influenced, even if it's even if it's uh, disdain for dispensationalism, that ends up influencing the way that they're mm-hmm. reading scripture. Yeah, and and that's a really Pete. That's an excellent point. And so I'm not backing away entirely from my proposition, but I think it has to be understood carefully. And maybe at least part of the confusion is that it's just very very difficult for people to hear the word dispensation without thinking of the whole big system. Right. Now, Mike Heiser, and full disclosure, he was a very, very dear friend, and I knew him all of his Christian life because Mm. just weeks after he got saved, he wound up at the college where I was teaching, you know, as a brand new Christian. (laughs) Couldn't find Ecclesiastes on the first try, I like to say, but, uh, (laughs) and I admire his scholarship, and I went to school on him, and we stayed close through the years, and he was a help to me in a lot of ways. But uh, it was it was uh, an interest, and he and by the way, he he read the Bible. Now he found some things that that you know I didn't find there, but he certainly was committed to grammatical historical interpretation, and and uh, I think his his theological construct kind of dictated at least what was more important than others, and 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 uh, and he had developed what he called his own biblical theology, and and and. Uh, was passionate about it to his credit. But having said that, I, I don't mean to make too much of them, but but I'm not suggesting that everybody who reads the Bible, literally, everybody who plays by the rules, is going to come out exactly where I am and so on. But uh, if the, the, the distinction that I would draw is that if there is a an, at least a recognizable, undeniable, I was going to say consciously embraced, but if not consciously embraced, it's, it's absolutely recognizable that they are not allowing the words to say what they're trying to say. Right. And, 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 and so, and I think, I think that's, that's dangerous. And I, obviously, and I'm going to come back where we started. And one other point I'd say with regard to what you, the points you were making and very telling and, and listen, I recognize that we all come. And this was, you know, the kind of the grand discovery of postmodernism. You know, I think you were still in diapers when this came up. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, this grand discovery that we, su- we finally came to realize that when a person reads any document, he brings his predispositions and his background and his biases. And we have to take, like, like duh, like this is something <sighs> new. Like, like, like you can live, you know, obviously. But the fact is, that when it comes to reading the Bible, do I bring my predispositions? Some of them theological, absolutely. But what's the one antidote? What's the one elixir for that? It is the hard work of exegesis that, that proceeds entirely and, 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 and enthusiastically on, on a commitment to grammatical, historical interpretation. The hard work of exegesis is as much as anything else about uh, enabling us by the Spirit to disabuse our minds. About, there's no other antidote. There's no other way to, to it, 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 it protect yourself against whatever uh, overly directional or, or, or even crippling bias you might bring to the Scriptures than simply doing the hard work of grammatic, playing by right. the rules of language. Exactly. And that means fixed meaning. It means, it means authorial intent. It means the words mean what they say. And, and, uh, so, uh, and, and that's the self-correcting, uh, you know, it, the dynamic of self-correction is a function of the fact that you have that absolutely black on white recorded revelation, which is fixed in its meaning and clear in its meaning. I'm not saying there aren't passages more difficult we can argue about, but good heaven's sakes, uh, perspicuity is, 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 I, I believe it more than some of my fellows, but, but, uh, uh, but the point is that it's because you have that, that, that repository of truth, of understandable, deliberate, carefully expressed, entirely dependable truth that you can measure whatever, whatever you think about that text with what it actually says. That makes Amen. sense to you. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things, uh, so obviously this has been really helpful walk, walking through these kind of parameters and the, the way we kind of gauge uh, even hermeneutics precedes our um, our theology, and, and that's how it ought to be. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, one of the things I would ask, this is totally off the cuff question, and uh, it'll be interesting to hear what you say on this. Uh, I've asked you know, multiple dispensationalists, do you think that somebody has to believe in a pre-trib rapture to be a dispensationalist? Absolutely not. I'm a pre-tribber. But, and I would make this distinction that I think you have to be premillennial. Uh, I mean, Revelation 20 is screaming at you. Yeah. But, I mean, I don't know. Do we get to decide who gets the laminated card, you know, and, right. and, and we teach the secret handshake and so on? But, <laughs> but, but no, we don't. But I think conceptually, just to make sense, you've got to be pre trib. And, 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 and w- w- the reason I would say that is because I think the Bible is absolutely explicit about the fact that there is going to be a thousand year stage uh, at the end of, uh, of human history. And it's called the kingdom or whatever the millennium is, we call it, and that it can't get here until Jesus makes. That's what you've said. If you're premillennial, there is a literal thousand year kingdom, thousand year stage of the eternal kingdom, actually, but there is a thousand year kingdom, and it's not going to happen until Jesus makes it happen. That's basically what you've said. I think the Bible's explicit about that. On the other hand, I, listen, I, I, whatever you believe about the timing of the rapture, you're kind of putting two and two together and hoping you didn't get 22. You know, there's no one text. I think, I, I, I think first Thessalonians, first Thessalonians may be the catching away, you know, and, and first, Thessalonians, and I, uh, but I wouldn't stake my life on it. You know, I, so, sure. so no, I do not believe that. Uh, and I, and I'm loath to generate a, you know, a list of requirements, you know, but by the same token, uh, what I'm saying is that I think you can come to the scriptures with, uh, uh, all the commitment, all the erudition, all the patience, all the submission of the Spirit of God, and and two different people can come away with two different ideas about the timing of the rapture. Sure, you know, I just but but it's curious that in so many quarters, the two are entirely collapsed. I mean, I mean, usually the critics of dispensation, you know, it's all about the pre-trib rapture oh, yeah. and so on, and and. So, well, and that's one of the reasons why I asked, just because I, I, I've even had, you know, multiple listeners reach out and say, Hey, I really jive with, you know, kind of the stuff that you're, you're teaching and I just can't get behind a pre-trib rapture. And usually I respond and I say, Hey, many, many people can't, you know, it's just, <laughs> right. it's, you know, I, I, we often talk about, this is, I'm, I'm pursuing your thought though. It's a bit of a tangent, but we often, you know, deliberate this question, a legitimate question. We used to do it under the heading of separation, you know, and what will you absolutely insist on? And, mm-hmm. and, and it's often, and usually as a matter of fact, and I'll just tell you up front, I don't like this, that, you know, that, that, that the essentials and the non-essential, you got to absolutely insist on how always think who decides what's essential. And on the other hand, do I want to stand before God and say, I know that's what the Bible says, but it didn't seem that important to me. You know, if, it, if God right. says it, I think the, the question as far as uh, whatever you want to do, I mean, let's make it real practical. Am I going to yoke up in a local church ministry who, for, with somebody who believes X when I believe Y? And I think the only real question is, in my mind, is the Bible absolutely explicit? The Bible teaches that. I think the Bible teaches that baptism is for adults, uh, for believers, I'm sorry, by, by immersion. I could probably we more, can be friends now. Yeah, I, I I make it a little more ugly about the believer than the immersion, but but uh, but no, I I believe in immersion. By the way, but it's just I think there are some examples of ablution, you know, and that sort of sure. thing that were that were, there was fully biblical baptism. But my point is that I wouldn't yoke up with somebody under me. I wouldn't curse him. I say, Lord bless you. You know, do what you can. I'll be thankful for all you do for the for for, for the gospel. But I'm not going to yoke up with somebody. Uh, who disagrees with me on what I believe the Bible is clear about? Because I'm 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 taxonomizing my commitment to Scripture, you know, and and uh, and I don't think it's healthy. I, I just don't think it's healthy. But that's a whole another another subject. But let let me go back to one other thing, and it relates to this, Pete, if you don't mind. And I I, I kind of wanted to say this to last very deliberately, but in a very passing reference to dispensationalism, or uh, a, a reference to what he regards as the superiority of non-dispensationalism. And, and again, folks, we could call this covenant theology. That doesn't exhaust it. We could talk of supersessionism. I think that almost exhausts it. Certainly this or that eschatological position, post or ambil, you know, that's not going to be helpful. But so what I'm saying in terms of this context is that Moeller suggested, I, I, I guess that's the right word. He, he proceeded on the on the 
commitment, you know, that non-dispensationalism was more resilient. And that's the word that he used. And this relates to something we said on the last podcast. But before we're done here, I'd like to return to it. Because, uh, and, and I think, you tell me what you think, Pete, but I think that what Dr. Moeller is thinking of is that, is that his theology, how, his non-dispensation theology, has all of this historical weight, this gravitas, and this legacy, and it's been around a long time, and it's still dominant in the, in the, in the ac- evangelical academy today, so it's got resilience. And, of course, this against the backdrop of this idea that dispensationalism is this novel idea that popped out of nowhere all of a sudden and people right. were in some drunken stupor and went for it for a while, but happily enough, it's gone. So, and, and, and the case can be made and has been, and I think appropriately, that, uh, like I say, rumors of dispensation of death are much exaggerated. It's still very, very vital. But my point is simply this, that it, this business of resiliency is important. And when I talk about resiliency, I'm not talking about institutions or denominations. Uh, what's at stake is a right understanding, a commitment to fully, rightly understand, fully, as much as, as a person can, what the Bible teaches. And I, I think it is absolutely manifest. I go back to what we said before, uh, what Paul said before I did, and what I mentioned earlier, that the, the ground, the buttress, that which keeps the truth secure from generation to day, generation, is the church. And, and, and this, this stunningly, delightfully uh, divine genius in raising up this, this, this organism, this body, this local body, where, as I say, uh, twice-born believers simply sit with their Bible open and they work their way through the Scriptures and so on. And, and, and by definition, as you do that, uh, ideas are going to be challenged. You know, maybe your ideas, maybe the ideas that have been precious to you and you're going to have to really think it through because you've only got one commitment. You've only got one source of authority, and that's the, the written word on the page. Uh, to me, uh, not to me, but I think biblically, and and I think it's borne itself out. You know, I have all these stories. I remember, I remember. This is a long time ago, but when China was opened by Richard Nixon, and uh, and and people be able to be able to go into China. Now it's a different place today than it was then. And they found this vibrant church, this well-taught church, and and they'd been totally, totally left to themselves. You know, and. Don't you know? <laughs> that, all they had was the Bible, and they were doing pretty well. Thank you. Now you know they could wow. use, and and so, uh, so my point is that that the point I think to be made in in conclusion, I think it's fair to say that dispensationalism is a simple commitment to playing by the rules when you when you read the Bible, and and I think that's all important, obviously, and I would argue that. Where we started out, we would argue the point that we're trying to make here, Pete, help me out here, but it is, is, is dispensationalism a legitimate way to read the Bible? And if you understand, it's nothing more than a commitment to playing by the rules and letting the Bible shape our theology and all of its, correct our theology in all of its parts. A, I believe it's fair to say that dispensationalism is a delightfully, God-honoringly, <laughs> legitimate way to read the Bible. As a matter of fact, I don't think there is any other legitimate way to read the Bible. And secondly, I would say, I've said it before, but as a believer, whoever you are, if you're mad at Buckman, and I don't blame you, but whoever you are, just ask yourself this the question, is it important that I think about how I read the Bible? Amen. And the, the distressing thing, among other things, quite honestly, of the, of, the, of the Moeller podcast was that one would reasonably anticipate that that was going to be the subject. And it never was the subject, but it left the impression that dispensationalism is not a legitimate way to read the Bible. That's what we're after here. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, you know, 
remind the listeners, if you've made it through the the full two parts, you kind of understand where we're coming from. There's there's disagreements that we have, but then also a positive presentation that this is this is, in our opinion, you know, the way that one should read scripture is the way that the author intended the meaning to be to be read. Now, I will also say, you know, it's funny, we we label it dispensationalism. That was a label that was hoisted upon mm-hmm. the movement, really. I mean, by its detractors. But uh, you know, you got James Hall Brooks, Darby, they never called it dispensationalism. They just said, we're just trying to read the Bible. And and that was novel, given the fact that the Roman church for a thousand years, and then even the, the English church that Darby confronted and so on. And he had his own issues with regard to the clergy and so on. And, and, but, but the fact is that, that it was unthinkable that he would simply sit down and read the Bible and allow it to say what it said. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing, by the way, like we got time to talk about this, but it is so difficult for, for believers, thinking deliberate believers today, to get their arms around the fact that this idea that you just read the Bible is so, it's not novel in the sense nobody ever heard of it, but it was suppressed, it was resisted, exactly. it was denied, and so on. And, 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 and that's the discovery Darby made. I'm just going to read the Bible and let it say what it says. Now, he came up with some goofy ideas, and I got my own set of goofy ideas and point them out to me, and I'll do the best I can. But, but, but that's what's at stake. Exactly. You know, it's interesting. Uh, in one of the interviews that Hummel did with Corey Marsh, he, uh, and I mentioned this one previously, but in talking it out, one of the admissions he said, which I thought was really hilarious given the circles that we run in, is he said, I had no idea I was stepping on such a landmine. <laughs> yeah, he, he said, because he, he was, you know, again, trying to, you know, do some historical research and present this. And he said, I didn't realize that this was such a debate, like what he was. No yeah. And, and obviously his circles are so different than ours. Well, they are. And so I, I just bring that but out. He was supposed to be too critical, but he was supposed to be historiographically, if you don't mind, investigating our yeah, circles and you right. should have stumbled upon the yeah. reality that this is a bit of a debate about this somewhere. Yeah. Along that effort, yeah. But. I just thought that was funny because, because of how much it, I mean, this has prompted, you know, we've done, you know, two parts on this now there've been other responses and discussions. So, Hey, it's good for his book. I'm sure he yeah, gets a lot yeah, of, a lot that's of probably press true. It, so. He's gonna, but, well, but thanks amen. so much book for joining us on these two parts. This has been really Mightily. helpful. I hope you'll, you know, it's been four years since you were last on the podcast to do your 10 insights into the life of Christ. I've been about it might, night by night. I well, you know, but, well uh, we're, we're really thankful that you've been. Well, uh, and I'll this. say, Pete, I'm thankful for what you do. And, and, uh, it's consistently a huge help to me. So I hope this may not be the most stellar of them, but thank you for what you do with the, uh-huh. uh, with the podcast. Praise the Lord. Just trying to do the best we can. And Amen. on that note, if you want more information on the podcast or about me, you can visit shepherds, uh, not shepherds.edu, petergaming.com. Or if you want more information on the shepherds theological seminary, you can visit shepherds.edu. If you have any other questions or comments, you can always reach out through the contact form on my website. Love hearing from the listeners, uh, whether they're positive or negative critiques, doesn't matter. I like to read them. So feel free to reach out that way. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.